every single one of us as Americans are guaranteed basic fundamental rights and freedoms that are enshrined in our Constitution. But we cannot take these freedoms for granted. I've introduced legislation to stand up for and to protect brave whistleblowers who've come forward to expose illegal actions within our own government or egregious abuses of power and to reform the Espionage Act to make sure that if a whistleblower is prosecuted under the Espionage Act, that they will have their fair day in court, something that is currently not allowable under the law as it stands today. So first I introduced HRS 1162 with my colleague, Congressman Matt Gates, that very simply calls on our government to drop all charges against Edward Snowden for the actions that he took in the public interest to expose a mass government surveillance program on all Americans that violates our privacy and civil liberties and that courts deemed illegal more than once. I also introduced HRS uh, 1175 with my colleague Congressman Tom Massey, which calls for the same action for the government to drop all charges against Julian Assange, who also acted in the pub uh, public interest as he published information to expose lies and egregious abuses of power in our own government. Last but not least, I introduced a bill, uh, H.R. 8452, to reform the Espionage Act. Now, Daniel Ellsberg was the first person prosecuted under the 1917 Espionage Act for his act of bravery in releasing the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post to publish classified documents that exposed the lies they were being told to the American people about what was really happening in the Vietnam War. Now Snowden, Assange, and others are being prosecuted under this same Espionage Act. But as Daniel Ellsberg knows well, under current law, none of them are allowed to speak to the intent of their actions in court. My bill changes that. I'm urging my colleagues in Congress to stand up for the American people, to stand up for our freedoms, and pass this critical legislation now. Compounded since the realization that he is in circumstances where he will inevitably not be able to see us and where he may himself die as a result of increased risk to COVID 19. Every lifeline that we have had in terms of my being able to support him have been shut down. I therefore cannot help him in the way that I have tried to do. I make this statement now only because our lives are on the brink. I fear that Julian could die. I have witnessed the degree of his suffering over a number of years, which I have found shattering, and have tried to help him, but don't any longer know how. I cannot elect to refrain from making this statement if it might assist the court in understanding that the circumstances in which Julian might be granted bail are wholly different from the circumstances of his life, and indeed mine, some eight years ago. Julian Assange and Belmarsh prison. Let's be clear what Belmarsh is. It's a high security prison, and the regime is brutal. It is absolutely brutal. In the last three months in Belmarsh, there's been two suicides and one murder. Julian himself locked up for 20 hours a day. And then when he meets his legal team, they take those hours off his normal, what they call association, so his free time when he can be out of the cell. He's applied, for example, to go to the gym, like other prisoners. And for weeks he's not been allowed to, and he still hasn't been allowed to either. It's the sort of regime that can push you to the edge. It's obviously had the effect on him. There's no doubt about that. He's used all sorts of strategies to make sure that he keeps as well as he possibly can. Obviously, he concentrates and focuses on preparing his case for the court. After two hours, I left that prison more convinced than ever before that this man, first of all, is innocent of the charges that have been brought against him. Secondly, that actually morally, he made the right decision what Julian Assange and his colleagues did was to take the information that they were provided with. Come on, fire! Hey, Roger. 
and their moral judgment was that these are war crimes being perpetrated here. Oh yeah, look at those dead bastards. In our name, and that they wanted the world to know. So he performed a service for society globally, not just within our own country. He mustn't be extradited to the United States of America, as I don't believe that he'll get a fair trial, a fair hearing. And the risk, therefore, is he could spend uh, the rest of his life in prison. Here we have the potential of the UK government rolling over to extradite someone, when at the same time the US government are refusing to extradite someone who we know is associated with an act that resulted in the loss of life for the Dunn family and needs proper investigation and, yes, if necessary, core action. The one thing you don't extradite people for is on political grounds. And that's what's happening with Julian Assange. But they want to send out a message to others, any other journalists, any other publishers, that this is what will happen to them as well if they dare to speak truth to power in the way that Julian Assange has. In any democracy, one of the key ingredients is to have a free and active media. And sometimes the media will annoy us. They'll tell us as politicians things that we don't want to hear, or they'll expose things that we didn't want exposing. But that's what democracy is all about. And as soon as you undermine that right of journalists to report fairly and openly, well, you start undermining the basis of the democracy on which we, we rest our society. Information is coming out now which demonstrates the extent to which the US government in particular will go to try and silence him, including the risk to his life. The media has not been kind to Julian Assange in terms of the accurate and honest reporting of his case. What we need now above all else is noise, noise about this case in every form that we can. Understand this isn't about an individual, this is about the right to free speech, the right to whistleblow, the right to stand up against injustice. And if Assange is silenced, they can silence anyone and they will. Please don't underestimate the importance of this case for the future of our democracy. Social media has been one of the few avenues. Media group. It's Friday, April 3rd, 2020, 4.14 p.m. I'm making a statement regarding my press release of Tuesday, March 31st. Titled the Advanced Media Group Press Release, subtitle Again Put in Harm's Way by the County of Lancaster. On Friday, March 27, 2020, I visited the Lancaster City Police Department headquarters and spoke to Officer Binderup and other, one other uniformed officer. I went to complain about the stalking and harassment of neighbors, particularly the Ramirez family of 1252 Fremont Street. I had known Officer Binderup and asked him if he could have an officer send a patrol car to just back up the alley. We had a discussion regarding the harassment and stalking of the occupants and visitors of 1252 Fremont Street and the other neighbors who again would not, not let me park in the back to unload my mulch. Officer Binderup asked me to file a complaint, another complaint, which I've done too many times. I filed my complaints before they ever started. I asked them to please just run a patrol car down the alley. In addition, right before this, I had two cars trying to rear-end me at the Wise Market parking lot. Every time I go to back out of the parking space, there and especially at Walmart or Lincoln Highway, another car in the parking spaces across from my own will back out as I do trying to hit my rear end or try to appear to hit my rear end. Now, I've been rear-ended three or four times in my life and the insurance companies had to pay me. Well, at the same time, an older Spanish male was inches from my front end trying to distract me so that I hit the other car. There was no contact by any of the cars. The day before this, this happened on a red light at Fruitville Pike when I stopped for a red light. The car behind me tried to push me to go through the light. When I stopped, he was inches from my rear bumper and then went around me, giving me the finger. On Monday, March 30th, 2020, I'd called my Leinster County Probation Officer, Mark Latou, to report the police conduct and to ask him if I am able to carry my pepper spray, which I purchased at an office max several years ago. Remember, I am 
on parole probation by the Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas until the year 2035 or until I am 76 years old. The probation sentence is from the stalking charges by the Ramirez family, cases number 6520-2017 and 0921-219. If you care to review these, the cases, they are classic Contel Pro arrests, all fabricated for the purpose of disposing of all my civil actions in state and federal courts, and to cover up the massive fraud and corruption by local, state, and federal officials dating back to the original ISC whistleblowing activities of 1987. There already have been some 33 false arrests with dismissed charges in the county of Lancaster since 1987. In 1987, when the extortion and fraud of my company, Financial Management Group Limited, and the first digital movie, Joint Venture, there were five felonies and four misdemeanors charged by the, Lancaster, by the Manon Township Police Department on September 2, 1987. All charges were dismissed in March of 1988 by then Lancaster County District Attorney Joseph Maddensbacher, former judge of Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas. Only a few months after the Ferrani ISC International Signal Control merger was completed, they dismissed all the charges. Ferrani was a leading defense contractor headquartered in London. I also reported the police contact. What, what did I get from Lancaster County Probation Officer Mark Ratu on Monday, this past Monday, Stan? I think you should call your counselor, Ken Ruffner, and talk to him. You sound frustrated, and I would not recommend you use the pepper spray. You have not been trained to use it. I told him that Ken Ruffner called me last week and, and is taking time off due to the coronavirus until further notice. Mark Ratu called me back and gave me the name of a supervisor at Community Services Group to talk to. I called the supervisor who scheduled me for a telehealth video chat at 1.45 p.m that day. Then after working outside my backyard screened in porch, I went inside to rest and treat my crippled backs, back and legs, only to come outside and find my porch and backyard terrorized. Broken locks on my large toolbox, newly painted landscape timber scratched, and screen door jammed again. Instead of getting police protection, I am again put in harm's way of physical violence and more harassment and stalking by the Lancaster County community. Over the past few months, since March 27th to 30th days, I have had my iPod docking station radio vandalized, all of my hand cleaners stolen, my carpets in my patio moved after I glued them, my razor blades for shaving stolen, my dishwashing soap stolen, my white cap with the light stolen a few weeks ago, a pair of pants stolen last week. So far, the cost of this vandalism and thefts since 2006, since I moved into 1250 Fremont Street, is over $24,000. Insurance companies don't pay. At Stonehill Road in Conestoga, I was paid twice by insurance companies. The cost just since being released from Lancaster County Prison on October 3rd, 2019 is over $4,000. This is the end of my statement. Again, it's Friday, April 3rd, 2020 at 4.20 p.m. This is Stan J. Catterbone. And the Advanced Media Group, and I'm at 1253 Month Street, Leicester, PA 17603. Thank you.
you're, you're not connected with the company. You're not a, yeah. a, an investor. Or no. But ISC stock, I sold off my ISC stock. I sold it uh, June 8th. I knew what was going down. I told a lot of people in town. A lot of people were saying that, that Ken Con, which was a minority, Christian the black guy, uh, was getting all the minorities over the contract because he wasn't leaving minorities to send contractors around. And actually, the, the, the supposition was, I don't know how true it would be, that it was a front for us. It was. I'll tell you why. Because when Ken Con was started, okay, back when they were, back to their inception, you look at ISC's books, they didn't have any money. Well, the first thing ChemCon did was they went and got all that free money from the government. And you look and see where that money went. I bet you I know where it went. This guy named Karen, Ken Sharon, I think his name is G-E-U-R-I-A or G-U-E-R-I-A. And I know that they were, I know that they were selling contracts back. He runs ISC and he also had his fingers pretty deeply in ChemCon. And He's the one who started Ken Con. Darren's the one who started it. You bet they were tied. You better believe they were tied with wet tax. <laughs> Same guys in wet tax were involved with ISC and Chemcon. ISC is a trade of the Chemcon. ISC is London Exchange. London Exchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need a thousand shares. I sold it when, I, when things started hitting the press. Yep. Now they just did a multi-billion dollar merger with this company in London. They're probably thinking it's going to cover the tracks. Yep. But what they did was they got fronted all that money started the contract, went bankrupt, and now the government stuck for $18 million. Yeah, they weren't paying employees, they weren't they were producing the product, they weren't paying their unemployment, they were anything else. Uh, and it turned out that Christian, you know, who I've had a few dealings with, uh, had an office that would be suiting of any, I mean, AT&T executive or having some security. Amazing. It was these racquetball things. It was an office. Uh, four or five cars, houses. Let me tell you about this, something about Jim Christian now. I know right now, in this town viewpoint, I stole money on insane and I'm going to test. I'll tell you, I will not condemn Jim Christian until he tells me to my face what happened. Right. I was framed and set up, and people, and I know oh, I see what in your experience. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if, maybe Jim Christian doesn't have the money. Maybe Garen has it or somebody else. $18 million is a lot of money. And he is broke because he lives with one of my best friends, Mister. I mean, they don't have money, and I would think that if he took it, he has something. Yeah. Who does the place stand by somebody that thinks you're kept for five years? All right. <laughs> you know, I know what the guy's going. I know what I'm going through, and who knows? Maybe he was. Maybe he was innocent. 
Iraqi Scud missiles, crude, inaccurate, and for the most part, ineffective. But the Iraqi military was well on its way to developing a far more powerful and accurate ballistic missile, one that was intended to carry nuclear warheads. And federal investigators tell us that some of the necessary equipment being used in that program came from the United States. If there were no license with these shipments, I am absolutely shocked to learn that that sort of activity was taking place. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Collins. Television and investigative journalism is something of an uneasy match. Television news thrives on immediacy. Thorough investigations take time. Television stories need pictures, video. Investigations attempt to uncover events which someone has tried to conceal. It's difficult to illustrate a cover-up, but try to be patient with us. What we're going to report tonight is part of an ongoing investigative effort by ABC News Nightline and the Financial Times of London. It is only one piece of what we believe to be a much larger fabric. But let's focus on what a number of sources, both inside and outside the U.S. government, have already confirmed for us. Remember these scenes? They were shot by an ABC News camera team in Baghdad on the night of January 16th, when U.S. aircraft began their bombing campaign against the Iraqi capital. That blizzard of anti-aircraft fire was directed in part by a radar tracking system sold to the Iraqi government by a company in South Africa. The South Africans sold quite a number of militarily useful items to Iraq, including cluster bombs and fuses. Those sales were handled by a Chilean middleman. But South Africa also conveyed to Baghdad some key technology that Iraq was using in the development of its ballistic missile system. All of this, the radar tracking system, the cluster bomb technology, the ballistic missile components, were sold by South Africa to Iraq. But most of what they sold, the South Africans had purchased from a company here in the United States. Officers of the CIA knew about those sales from the United States to South Africa, knew what was going, knew how it was getting there. Even though such sales were and are against the law, the CIA, the CIA did nothing to stop them. Nightline correspondent Jeff Greenfield has details of the story that was compiled by reporters from ABC News Nightline and the Financial Times. When you talk about the American heartland, you're talking about a place like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's Amish country. It's small town Main Street. It's Norman Rockwell covers of the Saturday evening coast. Lancaster, Lancaster, Pennsylvania was also the home of International Signal Control, Control, a home-growing home business that was a major regional employer, and whose founder and chairman, James Garron, was a generous regional benefactor. Garron was probably the greatest philanthropist in the decade of the 80s that Lancaster has ever known. There was something unknowable about the nature of the business, but it was sort of thought to be okay that government stuff is somehow it's okay. What ISC did was to make or supply military hardware and components, everything from cluster bombs to state-of-the-art electronic gear to blueprints, so their customers could build bomb factories of their own. But it's not what ISC made or supplied that has made it the target of federal prosecutors for the last two years. It's where ISC's equipment and technology and know-how wound up, and how it got there. An ABC Nightline Financial Times investigation has unraveled a startling story with three key elements. First, that highly sophisticated technology flowed from ISC to South Africa, including technology critical to long-range missile development, missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. Second, this technology went from the United States to South Africa in clear violation of the law. Third, these shipments went on for years with the full knowledge of Central Intelligence Agency officials. What's more, federal investigators say they have good reason to believe that some of this technology, including ballistic missile technology, shipped illegally from ISC to South Africa, was in turn sold to Iraq, where it wound up as part of Saddam Hussein's military machine that the U.S. fought against in the Gulf War. If these reports are true, 
and uh, I take it there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that they are, uh, then we have a renegade operation on our hands uh, for whom the rule of law means nothing. Uh, for which the elected representatives apparently have no control, have no ability to direct policy, have no ability to say what they can and cannot do. It all started legally, if covertly, back in 1974. That's when the National Security Agency, a super-secret U.S. intelligence unit, asked IAC to help it complete Project X, a chain of electronic listening posts based at South Africa's Simonstown Naval Station. South, South Africa, Africa was using these posts to follow Soviet, Soviet submarine traffic off the Cape of Good Hope. To ensure secrecy, ISC and the NSA made sure the shipments could not be traced back to them. They created a company called Gamma Systems Associates. In fact, this company was nothing more than a post office box at John F. Kennedy Airport. Gamma was a cutout. In other words, it's a straw man company, which uh, is technically not part of the government but it's, it's agreeable to the wishes of the government. But this sanctioned and covert operation stopped in 1977, when President Carter, a strong opponent of South Africa's apartheid regime, told the U.S. firm to stop any military-related business with the territory. But ISC continued shipping electronics, some civilians, some military, to South Africa. Then, in the early 1980s, South Africa began to intensify its efforts at ballistic missile development. For ISC, that was a golden opportunity, because one of its top executives was a man named Clyde Ivey, an American electronics expert who has been called the father of South Africa's missile program. Ivey had extraordinary contacts in that nation's defense structure. Beginning in 1984, federal investigators say, senior ISC executives, including Clyde Ivey, began regular contacts with CIA officials. And, these investigators add, the CIA officials had already been following what ISC was sending to South Africa. Over the next four years, the agency learned the whole picture. Reporter Tom Flannery is part of the ABC Financial Times investigation. Well, they knew that ISC was uh, utilizing a former national security agency cutout company, Gamma Systems Associates, to ship large volumes of very expensive, highly sophisticated military equipment illegally to South Africa from 1984 through 1989. And did the CIA tell anybody at all about it? They told not a soul, neither law enforcement nor legislative. And what specifically did the CIA know that ISC was sending to South Africa? Some of the most sophisticated electronic gear imaginable. Telemetry tracking equipment used to receive signals from missiles. Gyroscopes used to guide the missiles. And photo imaging equipment called film readers used to monitor a missile's performance. This equipment is exactly what a country would need to develop, test, and perfect long-range nuclear-capable ballistic missiles, which is what South Africa was doing in the mid-1980s. I think it's inconceivable that the equipment would be used for any other purpose. This was not small-scale business. The telemetry tracking equipment alone added up to nearly 20 tons, enough to fill a healthy chunk of a 747 cargo plane. Not everything ISC shipped was so enormous, but ISC was shipping equipment to South Africa almost every week for four years, much of it through the Gamma Systems Associate cutout. Moreover, this flatly illegal business went on, leaving an elaborate paper trail, utterly unimpeded by U.S. law enforcement, right up until the end of 1988. I would be shocked, and I would feel that I had been lied to if any sort of operation were going in which the agency or any other intelligence organization was trying to abuse customs by going around it or going through it. Indeed, the laws on the books passed by the Congress couldn't have been clearer in banning the sale of American military technology to South Africa. But there's another more disturbing twist to this tale of illegal arms shipments. Once the American-made hardware went to South Africa, it didn't stop there. South Africa, after all, is a major arms industry. And, as former Ambassador Herman Nichols says, it was an industry in the mid-1980s very hungry for customers. I think that the South Africans at that stage you know, were quite keen to, to sell almost anywhere. Including Iraq. For instance, ISC sold South Africa fuses for cluster bombs, one of the most effective killing machines around. South Africa took that technology and, in turn, sold hundreds of thousands of bomb fuses to Iraq 
a deal brokered by Chilean arms merchant Carlos Cardoon, one of the biggest suppliers of weapons to a grateful Saddam Hussein. In other instances, American technology went directly from South Africa to Iraq. What kind of technology? Well, look again at this incredible footage from the bombing of Baghdad on January 16th. That, says one American law enforcement official, that was some of the stuff that got through Iraq through the ISC shipments to South Africa. In this case, electronic components of a South African radar system guiding Iraq's anti-aircraft guns. Finally, federal investigators say even American missile technology made its way from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to South Africa to Iraq. Had the Gulf War not intervened, Saddam Hussein would have been well on the way to developing an operational Condor II missile, giving him, with the critical help of American-born technology, the power to deliver chemical or even nuclear weapons anywhere in the Middle East. I'm Jeff Greenfield for Nightline. We contacted the CIA this morning, gave them the broad outlines of the story you just heard and seen, and requested a reaction. At 7.15 this evening, the agency faxed to us the following statement. The Central Intelligence Agency declines to comment on these allegations concerning the activities of the International Signal and Control Corporation. However, it is the CIA's policy to cooperate fully with the Department of Justice on matters relating to possible violations of U.S. laws. We suggest that Nightline contact the Department of Justice regarding these allegations. That statement, as you may have noticed, is silent on the allegations of CIA misconduct. But, as suggested, we contacted Justice. It was by then, of course, after business hours, but a Justice Department spokesman returned our call. His statement was even simpler than the CIA's. It is not something we would comment on, one way or the other. When we come back, we'll discuss the implications of this story. Joining us now here in our Washington bureau are Senator Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania, who served on the Senate Intelligence Committee during the years when the weapons transfer took place. Jeffrey Kemp, a member of the Reagan administration's National Security Council and author of a forthcoming book on the global arms race. Stephen Bryan, former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, whose job was to stop the transfer of weapons technology. And one of the principal reporters in this investigation, Lionel Barber of the Financial Times of London. Senator Specter, as I just noted, you were a member of the Intelligence Committee during this period. Uh, should such an operation, had it been sanctioned, have come to the attention of your committee or some other congressional committee? Uh, if, in fact, there was such an operation, and I'm answering a hypothetical question because we only have the allegation, it would be the responsibility of the CIA to tell the Intelligence Committee under applicable law. They'd have to get a timely notification. Would you be free to tell us if indeed such notification was made? No, I would not be free to tell you one way or the other because all of that would be secret. But I can give you this generalization uh, that in the period from December of 1986 after Iran-Contra broke, uh, there was a very intense effort made by CIA uh, to be extremely careful on notification of covert activities. You and I spoke the other day, uh, and we were discussing in general terms the inclination of the Bush administration now to be responsive to this kind of thing. In other words, to make sure that the Congress is known. Uh, and, and if memory serves me correctly, you were suggesting that the, the administration really is disinclined to do that. Well, I believe that the president uh, is inclined to make no covert operations. Uh, there has been a refusal on the part of counsel to the president, and I'll be specific. Uh, Boyd Gray, the uh, lawyer who's counsel to the president, who very strenuously resisted an effort to have a statutory notification put into law. Uh, uh, the uh, officials around the president and the National Security Council, according to my understanding, and I've had it from very authoritative sources, were willing to have a statutory 48-hour notice, but Mr. Gray, Gordon Gray, the counsel of the president, was adamant in refusal on the ground that it would impinge on the president's constitutional authority. Mr. Bryan, I, I know you're somewhat skeptical just of the general notion that this kind of weapons technology would flow from the United States to South Africa. Is that correct? Well, I'm, I'm more uh, skeptical about it flowing to Iraq. I worked on the Condor case. In fact, I uh, tried to block it 
and I think we mortally wounded that project, and I never heard of any technology coming out of uh, South Africa. Primary source was West Germany uh, and Italy, and to a lesser extent, Argentina. But what about the notion of this kind of technology flowing from the United States to South Africa? Well, we, we tried very hard during this uh, period to interdict any technology that we knew of uh, going to South Africa or to any other country that was blocked from receiving military technology from the United States. And uh, this is a, a story that I never heard before. It, does, it, does it surprise you that weapons technology would flow, perhaps even without the knowledge of senior officials at the Defense Department? Uh, nothing ever surprises me nowadays, but uh, it's certainly not a story that we knew of uh, at the time that I served in the uh, Reagan administration. Dr. Kemp, uh, give us your sense of what justification, because indeed the whole notion, A, of weapons technology flowing from the United States to South Africa, and then B, as Mr. Bryan suggests, uh, that technology flowing from South Africa to Iraq, on the face of it, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, the South Africans and the Israelis, for example, are very close. The Israelis and the Iraqis are and have been for a long time bitter enemies. How, how could one justify something like that, even from a purely logical point of view? Well, I have no idea what the real story is, but in the, certainly in the 70s, remember, we were concerned about the Cape route, the flow of oil around the Cape route, and Soviet uh, warships. So that could be a reason for having some understanding with the South Africans. I think that was the reason. In the 1980s, it, could, it might have had something to do with us wanting to know what the South Africans knew about Israeli nuclear weapons and what the cooperation was, if any, between South Africa and Israel. That's purely hypothetical on my case. But, you know, in the past, technology has been used as a hard currency to get things or to persuade governments to do things that they might not otherwise want to do. This may be a case where that was going on. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'd like to go to my colleague, Lionel Barber, and, and Continuing now with Lionel Barber of the Financial Times. Lionel, uh, some of our guests here are skeptical, which is understandable, because so were you and I when we first began getting wind of this story. Uh, speak for a moment, if you would, about the, uh, about the documentary evidence that relates specifically to the transfer of the technology from the United States to South Africa. Well, we have got uh, Bill's lady, um, uh, referring to the technology which left JFK Airport and it specifically notes that the items concerned, missile technology and other advanced weapons, required export licenses. Uh, we know that they did not have export licenses and therefore were in violation of US law. Is there any reason to believe that they could have been, and I'd like you to explain if you would, uh, what a presidential finding is, that there might have been a presidential finding which, which, which could have perhaps set aside even U.S. law uh, and, and permitted this kind of an operation to go forward? Well, a presidential finding, uh, which is, uh, sees uh, a uh, covert operation as in the national interest uh, of the United States, would have to be uh, passed on, or the information would have to go to relevant congressional, uh, senior congressional members. And we have contacted several of those who would have been in a position to know, who ought to have been told, and they say they know nothing about this at all. But I think there's a very important point here, Ted. The fact is that uh, informed officials in and outside the government have told us that actually the CIA knew about these shipments but it was not a sanctioned covert operation. And in that respect, they wouldn't have had to inform Congress. But there's only one problem here, and that is that if CIA officials were aware of legal of violations of the law, they needed to pass on the information to the Justice Department, and they did not. Mr. Bryan, uh, you were shaking your head a moment ago. Why? Well, because it's not the CIA's job to enforce the law. Their job is to provide the information to the government officials who, who have that responsibility. And, and uh, typically, uh, uh, they know about thousands and thousands of, of these kinds of things that go on, and they, they report them diligently. And the government officials try to sort through them, try to pick out the ones they think are the most uh, serious uh, to go after them and, and to deal with them. Well, if I could just come back here, I think... Uh, the fact is that we know that there were breaches of the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act in 1986, Export Administration Act, 
uh, the U.S. arms embargo, and I mean, there was plenty of evidence to suggest uh, that, that there were violations of the law and that the CIA had a responsibility to pass on that information to the Department of Justice. Yeah, well, may I raise a question, please? Uh, a key point which has been made here is whether the matter was sanctioned by the CIA. Now, that's really the critical factor here. The obligation of the CIA to report to the Intelligence Committee and the obligation of the CIA to report violations of law arises when the officials, responsible officials of the CIA know about it. When Lionel uses the word sanction, the question arises in my mind as to whether it was a rogue operation and not known to the top officials of the CIA. And when Lionel has documented uh, certain bills of lading as to transactions in South Africa, I would be interested if he cares to, to document the uh, evidence that shows knowledge on the part of uh, CIA top officials uh, to show that it was, in fact, sanctioned. Well, well we have uh, been working on this story for a number of weeks. We have contacted dozens of people. We have interviewed people over and over again. And we have uh, several sources who say that there were regular briefings between ISC uh, executives and CIA officers on what was going out from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to South Africa. Whether that information was passed up the ladder, higher up to uh, senior CIA uh, officials, uh, I do not know. Let me raise a somewhat broader question and, and pose it again to Senator Specter. I thought you use a term which had a great resonance in the mid-70s, a rogue operation. I thought that kind of thing was supposed to have been brought under control. Well, uh, it is supposed to have been brought under control, uh, but I picked up Lionel's term on sanction, and he injected the concept that uh, the operation may not have, uh, have been sanctioned. If there's any evidence that anybody from the CIA was involved, I can tell you flatly uh, that the Senate Intelligence Committee which I had served on, and the House Intelligence Committee for that matter, would be very interested to pursue the matter. And it may well be, and I would expect that uh, the top CIA officials would be too. If there is evidence, it ought to be pursued in official channels as well as the investigation, which of course uh, uh, the Financial Times has every right, as does Nightline, to pursue. Let me just warn our affiliates that we're going to be going a, a few minutes over our allotted time tonight so that we can complete uh, at least this phase of the story. Uh, and let me just put to uh, Dr. Kent for a moment. What we are discussing here, Dr. Kent, is, after all, uh, not just an occasional shipment, but almost weekly shipments that went on for four years, including some very sophisticated, militarily important equipment that went aboard South African Airways from JFK to Pretoria, as I say, week after week after week, over a period of four to five years. Yes, sir, we saw the allegations made by Richard Babion, the self-professed arms dealer, now awaiting trial for security charges in the Florida jail. Have you ever met Richard Babion? Not that I'm aware of, sir. Babion claims that he first met with you and a Mr. M.K. Moss in Geneva in June of 1984. Is this true? No, sir. Fabian claimed that you, working with M.K. Moss, ran a covert CIA operation to supply arms to Iraq. Dr. Gates, have you ever been aware of any CIA or U.S. government covert operation to supply arms to Iraq? No, sir. Fabian claims that you were a very good friend of Carlos Sardong and that one of your pet projects was to transfer cluster bomb technology to Carlos Sardong. Dr. Gates, were you ever involved in an operation to transfer cluster bomb technology to Carlos Sardong? No, sir. Now, Dr. Gates, I will ask you a few questions about the weapons that were allegedly transferred to Iraq by South Africa by a company in Lancaster, Pennsylvania called International Signal Control, or ISC. Before the CIA was informed by the FBI in December 1986 that ISC was under criminal investigation, were you aware of possible illegal activities on the part of ISC. No, sir. A story in the Financial Times alleged that you may have gone to visit ISC in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Have you ever met with officials of ISC? Not that I'm aware of. Have you ever been to Lancaster, Pennsylvania? No, sir. I wonder if you can give us a short synopsis, and that will conclude my questions, Mr. Chairman, of 
why, uh, what's the motivation for these seemingly outlandish and far-fetched uh, uh, efforts to associate with your, your, your good nature? During the 70s and 80s, today was indicted, was indicted along with other executives who worked at International Signal and Control. News has been following this story for years. Tonight, Susan Shapiro begins our coverage from the federal courthouse in Philadelphia. At a packed news conference, U.S. Attorney Michael Bailson detailed major indictments against James Garron and other top executives of International Signal and Control. The Lancaster defense contractor is accused of masterminding a scheme that involved illegal arms sales and a $1 billion fraud. The purpose of the financial fraud was to make phony contracts look authentic and build up the value of ISC into something that it was not. The enormous and complex scheme, which was described as looping, was apparently enough to defraud British defense contractor Ferranti International which merged with ISC in 1987. Ronnie itself initially couldn't believe that they had been frauded until our agents explained the depth of the problem to them. Ferranti told News 8, we have been cooperating with the U.S. government and are glad to see those efforts come to fruition. Garen is charged with eight counts, including financial fraud, mail fraud, securities fraud, money laundering, and violation of arms control laws. Officials of six federal agencies who were here show off some of the weapons they say ISC shipped illegally to South Africa and in turn ended up in Iraq during the Persian Gulf War. After the war with Iraq, proximity fuses like this were found inside of Iraq. Inside were power supplies that could be traced to ISC in Lancaster. And from a DOD standpoint, the flagrancy of this case is that ISC and its officials put greed and the ability to make a buck ahead of our fighting men. Garrett's attorney, Joseph Tate, issued a statement saying that technology is known around the world and anyone can obtain it. In addition, officials here would not comment on an allegation that the CIA had full knowledge of the armed shipments. Many government agencies, including the CIA, cooperated in this investigation, and I think I should just leave it as that. Garrett, who made a plea agreement with the federal government, was not arrested, but other top company executives who worked closely with him were taken into custody in Lancaster and arraigned in Philadelphia. Terrence Bowles was picked up at his home in Holtwood. Thomas Jackson was picked up at his home on Butter Road. Robert Clyde Ivey, who's also known as Ringley, was arrested at his residence on Cochran Drive. And Wayne Radcliffe, here at his home on Grand Oak Place. His relatives didn't want to talk. No. Not saying. This news conference attracted media from all over, including London. Ferranti is a major British company, and the billion-dollar fraud here is expected to split the city of London. Affected a lot of people, so what began as a very small defense firm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, has now turned into an international scandal. Just take a look.